Hi, this is Tom Needham, and you're listening to The Sounds of Film, and I am very excited to have on the phone with us today, Allison McDowell. She's a mother, an independent researcher studying the World Economic Forum's The Fourth Industrial Revolution. She's well known for her videos, which you can find on YouTube, as well as her website, wrenchinthegears.com. Hi, Allison, and um, thank you so much for joining us today on The Sounds of Film. I understand. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, uh, I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, I've heard you on so many different podcasts, and as I mentioned, seen you on in, on YouTube videos, and uh, you, you seem to be one of the leading voices talking about some of the, the large issues affecting mankind moving forward. Um, now, I understand that you first got started uh, investigating the privatization of schools in Philadelphia. I have a career in education myself, and I was wondering what it was exactly that you uncovered in, in your activism um, that kind of led to you eventually moving on to investigate the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Well, I mean, it was sort of a turning point. In 2013, um, our district had hired Boston Consulting Group, and they closed um, 23 schools, um, which was incredibly disruptive, and I laid off 3,000 teachers. It was, it was, it was terrible. And um, that was in the spring. And then um, by the middle of the summer, they had brought in a consulting group um, to talk about um, developing a school report card <laughs> framing and that would only apply to the public schools, not the charter schools that were grandfathered into some other you know, division. And um, so I went to this meeting because whenever they have these summer meetings, they realize that you don't really want many people to attend. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so we, we rallied about 40 or 50 people to come and say, you know, this is you've created this terrible destruction of our school district and now you're going to grade these schools. I mean, this seems crazy. And especially since the charter schools were not going to be affected in the same way. And um, th there were a number of policies that were advancing, including um, a common application where people could apply for, um, we have like a magnet school you know, program that you would apply to just um, to charter schools, public schools, and private schools and religious schools. So it was really opening up like all of these options to channel people out of the public schools. And it turns out in the meeting, I found out that the, the funder that was backing this was the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. And, you know, from that point, I was like, oh, you know, it's about you want to sell computers and software and, and you know, cloud computing and that sort of thing um, because they're using all of the test scores and the standardized curriculum to, to close the schools. And so at that point, I got I got um, started in the, the opt-out movement because Pennsylvania had a legalized opt-out of testing. And I thought, well, we'll keep the data from you and then you can't weaponize it against our kids because they weren't closing these schools to make them better. They were closing schools to, to push privatization um, and also to push a lot of this technology. And so I did that for several years. But what I realized along the way was that the Dell Foundation, you know, it wasn't just the computers, but it was actually a larger system of like surveillance hmm. through our educational technologies and extraction, like extracting value out of our children for like essentially child labor on these platforms, which are not just tied to Dell, um, you know, and one of their primary clients is the NSA, but was also Google, right? Like we were also feeding our, our all of the school Gmail accounts, uh, email accounts had transferred to Gmail accounts. So then all of the Google classrooms were like feeding these systems to train their AI machine learning. And, and very few people, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a nice technology until you realize that it's going to be used to replace, you know, human teachers. And no one could believe me that that would happen. But, um, and yet, like, sort of here we are. Um, and so for a while, I did standardized testing, and then I, I thought, well, they're actually moving out of that to testing all the time through the technology and, and talking about self-testing. So I was looking into sort of the militarization and the surveillance aspects of educational technology and the way they were using artificial intelligence under the guise of personalized learning to almost create feedback loops for kids and track them, like levels of tracking that I believe are unacceptable. And then... Um, and then I was, you know, I, I could only go so far with that because, honestly, the teachers are really overwhelmed, and they, they weren't able to really see the depth, you know, that I was seeing. And so this idea of data-driven, um, creating data streams based in managing poor and vulnerable communities for profit by larger consultancies and technology companies was something that was not simply limited to schools, but that there were similar streams in both health and addiction and housing and these other areas. 
and, and I'm in Philadelphia, which is a very poor city. Um, and so we have, we're being set up for what's called the impact economy, which is this data-driven approach to um, the privatization of all social services. Oh, my goodness. So it kind of expanded from there. So, Allison, you're talking about so many different things here. Um, for, for our audience who's just trying to catch <laughs> up and, and kind of take in what you're talking about, let's, let's go back a little bit to some of the stuff about school. Um, you know, obviously, due to coronavirus, uh, kids all over America now and all over the world have received technology uh, that enables them to learn remotely. And um, while no one's thrilled with that, I, I think people were happy that they could do something. And yet what I'm gathering from some of the stuff that you were just talking about, as well as some of the things I've been reading um, of yours, it seems to, to be that you're kind of saying that we need to be very, you know, very concerned about the danger of their data being not just collected and gathered, but that that our kids are being used for data and that they're going to be used as future investment opportunities. Um, I mean, I think people hear about how, like, oh, people are selling your data. Um, you know, they hear about that all the time, like anyone who's on the Internet. But I don't think people fully grasp what you're talking about in terms of how a lot of this technology that's being given to our kids is, is being done under the premise that there's there's money to be made with data and for investment opportunities. Can you explain this a little bit more clearly? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, clearly replacing, you know, there's always money for technology, even as they're cutting back teachers. And um, essentially, people should look up um, Knowledge Works is a company, um, is an entity that was funded by Bill Gates. And their vision for education in the future was that was called something called a learning ecosystem. And it, they, they pitch it in a way that sounds exciting, like the city as your classroom. But really what Knowledge Works is about is about essentially dismantling most bricks and mortar schools in favor of sort of a Pokemon Go education types of type of thing where you would you would go around and do different things and collect sort of skill points and badges. And it sounds it sounds crazy. <laughs> you know, I used to tell this to my husband. I'm like this is what they say the vision of education is. And he's like, that would never happen. They would never give up their schools. And I'm like, well, now, like, it's seeming a lot closer. But this idea that the technology in it, it's not just screen-based, right? It's its not simply just the Chromebook kind of education, but increasingly it will also be wearable technology. And um, the push towards digital vouchers is that it's almost like you're – like a character in a video game. I mean, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but we're seeing this here in Philadelphia that, like, the idea that you would go to the library and earn points and badges outside of your school. And so the Pay for Success, Pay for Success was embedded in the Edu uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. So the most recent revision to the, the federal uh, education legislation, the ESSA, um, included a provision called Pay for Success. And what that provision meant was that you could use software or programs that would be used as investments towards what they would call success metrics. But the success is always a narrow thing, like a third grade test score. It's not a big thing. Um, it's not really meaningful in terms of true education. But it's this pay for success provision essentially set up that different softwares or different programs could then become investments based on children attaining certain scores or certain metrics on benchmark testing or end of the year testing or perhaps a career pathway, you know, a skills badge with a career technical education certification in high school. Um, these different things would be set up as paper performance contracts within the education system. So it's not just the selling of the computers and the software, but actually it is tracking children as human capital tied to data analytics. And, 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 and increasingly tied to workforce pathways that are linked into planned regional economies, which sounds kind of difficult. But if you look up the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act that was put in place by Obama, the idea that different regions would have different employment sectors and that children, through their educational pathway, would be tracked into those 
very narrow sectors. And it almost sounds like the Hunger Games, but I encourage people to look up the WIOA um, plan for their community. You should be able to find it. It's usually by region, like ours is a five-county area. And that the children would literally be tracked into these career pathways by their education system. And this goes back to um, uh, Mark Tucker and the um, NCEE, NCEE uh, National Council on Education and the Economy, I believe, which is based in Rochester. And he's been, they've been working with the Carnegie Institute since the late 1980s to plan an education system that is aligned to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's goals in these planned regional economies. And so, you know, the education that is going to be offered is not holistic um, education that is steeped in arts and humanities and physical education and all of these things. It's going to be very narrow, and it's going to be channeling children into industries that will be tied to this fourth industrial revolution. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's, it's funny. Kind of when, yeah. when, when you talk about um, – the, the getting away from traditional school buildings and, and using technology. It, it all sounds very strange, but I, I don't know if you remember over, um, I think it was the summer or maybe it was in the, at, the, at the end of the spring, Governor Cuomo in New York kind of surprised everyone. You know, he was giving one of his famous press conferences and talking about coronavirus and the topic of school came up. And then all of a sudden, just out of the blue, like he... He mulled like, you know, I, I've been thinking, you know, we need to rethink about, you know, our perception of what education is and why do we have these buildings? And I've been talking to Bill Gates and and everyone was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but then, like now I started reading your stuff and it sounds like maybe he was referring to some of the things that you're referring to. D did, did you hear about Governor Cuomo talking about that? Yeah, yeah. The re well, the reimagining education is something that was actually looked into, um, gosh, it's been, I think, around 2015. Um, there was something called Convergence and Reimagine Education. And so they've, um, uh, it was essentially reimagining education. And both the NEA and the AFP had representation on this, okay? So the, the TEDs of the unions know what's coming with this, with this new model. And I think it is very much that it's a decentralized model. And I think in many respects, they, they have these relationships with the after-school and out-of-school time providers that have been set up for a long time through, um, like, after-school programs and summer camp programs with the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA and these other, um, like, non-traditional learning spaces. And they've been very clear about setting up uh, record and information sharing across platforms between schools and these um, out-of-school time providers. And I think in some, at some point, like that was my projection that they would flip the switch and they would say, well, you know, our budget will not sustain schools anymore, so we can't open in the fall. Like that's, you know, every year in Pennsylvania we would hear that, oh, they don't have the budget, the state doesn't have the budget, like what's going to happen? And, I, you know, I said at some point, and this was, I was not thinking, you know, pandemic crisis, right, that, that the school budgets will say we just can't open. And then the, then the non-traditional providers will step in and say, well, we'll take the children. All it is is really a Chromebook. Like you can send us some AmeriCorps students, right? Like we'll have AmeriCorps just to make sure the kids don't beat each other up and we'll just, just do education on a Chromebook. Because how hard is it anyway, right? It's just, <laughs> just log in. Right. <laughs> and oh, at that goodness. point, you know, and then they might have the, the vans that would pick up the, so the kids and, you know, that would be the little kids. The high school kids would just be on their own, and the, the middle and elementary school kids would, you know, occasionally be taken out in a van to some sort of extracurricular activity to earn some badges. And 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 I, you know, it's hard, it's it's almost unimaginable to say that, but I think you know, knowing how far we've gone down this road under this the, this coronavirus situation, like it's not, it doesn't seem that far off anymore that people would just throw in the towel and say, well, you know school doesn't work anyway. We never really liked it. It ended up just being about testing and, and, you know, they took out the arts and they took out theater and they took out the libraries. I mean, that's in Philadelphia. Most schools don't have any of that anymore. The only thing you do is you go to be tested pretty much. And who wouldn't want to give that up? Wow. You know, so they gutted it on purpose to make it horrible. And then like, oh, look, here are the people who are offering you the chess club and, you know, the drama, you know, community theater and all these things. Well, now you can just earn badges. And this is, this effort was um, set up by the MacArthur Foundation with, in partnership with Mozilla, which is these digital badges. And they have about, 
12 cities that are called cities of LRNG, LRNG, and Philadelphia is one. San Diego, Dallas, many of them are also smart cities. So this idea of cities with um, sensor networks and that these kids would just be sort of shoved out the door and told to learn stuff, you know, with these interactive games. And um, it's it's kind of a horror. I know I probably sound crazy, but I encourage you to look it up. No, no, no. <laughs> I've been, I've been reading your stuff. I, I, I hear Macarza. what you're saying. It's called Collective Shift in LRNG. Yeah. Um, KnowledgeWorks especially has many white papers about this model, about uh, wearable technology, about learning through virtual reality, that it's some wonderful global enterprise that we're all going to put on our virtual reality headsets and, like, work with people all over the world. <laughs> like, that's what they're pitching. Because I thought, well, what does this look like? I have friends. The whole um, state of North Dakota's education system was being taken over by this competency-based education model. Sometimes it's called mastery-based or a proficiency-based. And these models are um, all about check a box. Did you do a task? And these things will be uploaded to learning lockers using this XAPI technology. And I was like, well, what does a learning ecosystem look like in, like, some small town in North Dakota, right? Like, I'm in Philly. At least we have a lot of stuff. Like, theoretically, right. <laughs> you can go earn badges in a lot of interesting ways if that's what you were going to do. But what does that look like in some small rural town? Well, it looks like your education is in a headset. Oh, wow. I mean, it's crazy. But I think that, that if we don't stop that, that's where it's going to go. Now, I heard you talk about a film, you know, this is the sounds of film, um, that kind of opened your eyes about a few things. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, The Big Short? Yeah. Okay, and, and that you saw this movie, and it's it's about mortgages and finance and stuff like that, but that when you saw it, it, it made you think about school and other aspects of our society in a different way. Can you explain? Yeah, well... When I was doing a lot of my research around education, I was looking at, um, it's called social impact finance or pay for success. And it's this idea of using uh, predictive analytics and real-time data tracking to create essentially new debt instruments tied to social welfare services. So th this idea... The first ones were called social impact bonds, and they were developed in the United Kingdom by a gentleman. His name is Sir Ronald Cohen. And then Michael Bloomberg uh, brought them to the United States, and they've been piloting them over the past about 10 years, eight, eight years or so. Um, the first one was at Rikers Island. And these, these debt instruments, essentially the premise is there is a, some negative externality, some bad outcome that has a cost. So in this case, the first one was at Rikers Island, and it was a youth program. And the negative externality was reincarceration. Okay, they said, oh, if these kids who are currently incarcerated are reincarcerated, it's going to cost the public coffers this big amount of money. Let us do an intervention with them that would reduce the level of re, uh, you know, reincarceration, and that would save us money. Okay, that's the premise. Um, so that they're saying that the cost to fix someone is less than the cost that would be to fix, the cost to fix someone now would be less than letting them escalate in some other bad way and would cost us more later. So that's the premise. Um, they've also developed these for pre-K. And, and so the cost offset for that instead of reincarceration was special education. And they said if we give children who are screened as being at risk, Special edu or quality pre-K, when they come to kindergarten, fewer of them will need special education. This social impact bond was in Salt Lake City, was backed by Goldman Sachs. And in this concept, there were 100 children screened into this preschool program, and at the end, only one of them needed special education. And if you look at the coverage of that, even in the New York Times, they said that is not a really realistic number, that only one child would need special education, that there was something wrong with that model. Mm. Either that there were children who were screened into the program who didn't need it, or there were children who were being denied services or some combination. But in any event, it, it advanced, and Goldman Sachs made a lot of money on it. Um, there's a similar program in Chicago that has two metrics. One is tied to special education in kindergarten, and one is tied to a third-grade test scores in literacy. So they're creating these benchmarks that will generate profit for investors. And we know often the data can be gained. You know, I think most of us who follow the privatization issues know that they can gain the data how they want it. And so these products are essentially steeped in predictive 
profiling, right? Like it's based in the fact that it's almost pre-crime, yeah. <laughs> you know, that your burden, either your burden of having a chronic illness or your burden of being underemployed. They have a Richard Layer has a, an equation that was used to scale mental health in the National Health Service in the UK. And so he created a number that was around unemployment and depression. But then the only therapies you could get were ones that would create the data to fulfill the deals. Like so you would have to do online therapy. You couldn't just go see a therapist because that wouldn't create the data that they would need to fulfill these deals. So everything has to be mediated through data analytics. And these are human capital bonds. And these human capital bonds, you can look at, um, they have been being developed by the San Francisco Federal Reserve as in the lead. Um, but there are a lot of papers in the different central banking offices in the U.S. that are linked to um, reskilling and social impact bonds. And so they've been working on this for about the past decade, at least since like the last economic crash. And these ideas of these social impact bonds tied to people, you know, what I've said in the past is that we're, we're deal what we're dealing with is a global political economy problem. And right now, so much of the wealth is concentrated at the top. You know, we have a very small number of people holding so much of the wealth that they cannot continue to circulate that wealth and grow the economy because literally all of the people at the bottom are so poor, they cannot enact the spending needed to keep the economy going. And so what is going about to be happening is that the poor people will be turned into debt instruments and to be gambled on. And what happened with the last global economic crisis, you know, they created these mortgage funds and pushed housing onto people to channel their capital because they were in a similar place that they needed debt products to channel their capital through. And then we saw ultimately there was a crash, you know, that it was not sustainable. Since then, in the, you know, decades since, it's only gotten more concentrated. And the only, um, only entity that can be channeled that is bigger than housing is people, is bodies. And so essentially we will become the next debt instrument and we, our debt will be linked to our public benefit access. What do we need by way of education or reskilling? Because it's not just children. All of the people put at work by the lockdowns will be reskilled. And those are being done through these income sharing agreements that will be securitized as new equity markets. What does that look like for chronic illness, right? And, and mental health illness, because we know, again, the lockdowns are creating a lot of issues around mental health and also addiction and other things with people trying to figure out how to navigate this stuff. What does this look like in terms of housing access, right? Because our public housing has been privatized as well. And they're looking at like creating new housing models that are like tiny houses and full of internet of things, sensors and things that will all of which pull data out of individuals and profile individuals as burdens, predictably profile people as the extent of their burden on the world, as opposed to, you know, a being that has creative like secret potential, and that's what's so despicable about this new model and that no, very few people are thinking that that's what's happening. But the, the lockdowns will push so many more people as dependents on the state. And, and what I, I often talk about is that we need to understand what we did to indigenous people in this country in terms of removing them from their ability to live on their lands and support themselves and, and corral them in reservations and take their children and erase their culture and then offer annuities that were then went we didn't actually provide and people starved to death. And that's, I feel like that's where we're moving is that we're moving into this public private partnership model in which millions upon millions will be dependent on, on a state. And then our dependency will be created as a new global investment market. I think it's not just for, not just not like companies in the U S but these are companies all over the world. These are the Vatican bank. This is soft bank. This is Jack Ma. This is any entity that's holding all the capital. They will be investing in us and then tracking us for compliance. I think this is exactly what you're talking about, but I, I mentioned at the beginning that you researched the fourth industrial revolution. Um, can you just explain what the exactly the fourth industrial revolution is and how it relates to everything that you've just been talking about? Sure. Um, so I encourage people if they would go to like the World Economic Forum's website. I mean, these are some of the, the most you know, powerful, you know, corporate interests in the world. Um, they gather every January in Davos and they sort of lay things out. Um, and uh, last year or in 2019, their model was um, 
uh, globalization 4.0, and then this year it was stakeholder capitalism, which is everything I've just talked about. And so they've laid out essentially that the COVID is this opportunity for this great reset, which is ushering in the fourth industrial revolution. And there are many elements to this fourth industrial revolution, but primarily it has to do with um, advances in artificial intelligence, in um, automation, in robotics, in the Internet of Things, which are these sensor networks, which are everything from your phone to your smart streetlight to your smart trash can to your smart refrigerator, <laughs> all of these sensors that are transmitting information, um, including synthetic uh, synthetic biology and bioengineering, so a and, and nanotechnology, things that most people don't even have on their radar in terms of like remaking the, the life on the planet through these engineered systems. Um, you know, and quantum computing, right? So it's it's essentially totally remaking the world as, a, in my mind, as a mechanized structure. Um, and and that this is being done not because the people of the world are asking for it, it's because it's coming from the top down. And the implications are then that humanity and, and life on the planet will primarily exist to create um, this virtualized world that is advancing um, because it has to be coded into being, right? And, and people have to be trained in all of these sectors. And you can see, like, Jack Murphy, who's the governor of New Jersey, he's creating these career impact bonds, which are based on the model I talked about, this cost offset, and they're funded with these income-sharing agreements. And the idea is that you would have your future wages garnished. You would go into an agreement that if you get trained, you would pay back your training and your social services even um, by by having your wages garnished. But the only three sectors that you could go into were um, like smart energy, uh, coding, and uh, farm the pharmaceutical industry. So what? So what people's do you options were very limited in terms of what you could be reskilled into, and you would be reskilled into one of these divisions that would be building up the fourth industrial revolution. So, so what is motivating the people at the top that you're talking about? Is it that they're just looking for ways to make more profits, or is it a way of controlling people? Uh, like, what's what's the motivation for this great reset, in your opinion? Um, well, I mean, I think the people who are at that upper threshold have so much money, it's not really just about money, right? But it's almost a house of cards that if, if you don't keep upping the ante, the whole thing, it's like a giant Ponzi scheme, it all falls apart. And so my sense is, is that this idea, you know, of capitalism it has to continue to grow and expand. Like that's the premise of, of the capitalist economy. And that we are reaching a moment of maximum um, maximization of the world's resources. And so there is a push to actually break through and create a virtualized world in which that growth of consumer consumption could continue happening, but in a virtualized space, which would not mean that there are no resources consumed, but they would be consumed in somewhat different ways. And so I would say, for example, if you have kids in school right now, chances are they have some sort of gamified behavior management app in their classroom. And this gamification um, is about earning for your avatar. You have a digital avatar and you earn things like outfits or privileges and things for that. And that's all virtual economies. That's the Minecraft. That's Microsoft pushing the kids into Minecraft. Um, and that is training people to live in a virtual world. And there's actually a, um, a paper that was shared with me by some teachers in Tokyo, actually, this past week that was rather shocking. But it, it, if you look it up, it's called the Moonshot Research and Development Project. And it was, um, this is the government of Japan. Um, so it's not, it, it's the Japan, you know, their technology division. It's not just a crackpot thing. It's about six different divisions of the government of Japan, which is SoftBank, which is one of the largest banking systems, and also robotics and NTT, Nippon, Telegram, and Telegraph. And they have a white paper that essentially asserts a future called Society 5.0, and in which everyone will be a digital twin. Oh, man. <laughs> they actually call it cyborg avatar capitalism. Wow. I've been talking about it generally. Like, I think that this is what it is, like the world of the video game. 
Yeah. But realistically, like this paper exists. It was put out in December 2019 for cyborg avatar capitalism. So these very powerful entities are imagining that both to control us and to continue to extract value out of our lives, that we need to become increasingly virtualized and exist in these sort of, um, you know, binary ones and zeros as data. So I think it's both, it's, to me, it seems like people have become slightly unhinged, you know, that I feel like these are the people at the top are so above, they've just separated themselves from any kind of normal humanity. And perhaps they think that they are godlike and that, that they have it within their power to do that to the rest of us. And I just have to feel in my heart, like as a mother, that once people understand that I mean, it may not make sense to anyone why anyone would do this for normal people. No one would think that this was a, an okay thing to do. But it's this hubris of, like, supposed enlightened scientism of this, you know, that we should become transhumanist, that that is something to aspire to, that, that actually this paper said that you will be separate, you will sort of be relieved of the burden of having a physical mind and body in time and space. Oh, my goodness. You know, Crazy. I, mean, I, I if you I, didn't I, actually <laughs> read it and you didn't realize it was from the government of Japan and not some fringy thing, you might, you know, but it, I, you know, I, I actually had to send it to my college age child to say, listen, like, I don't want to have to tell you this, but p- people need to know the structure because if, until they are willing to grapple with the fact that the people at the top of this pyramid are acting in totally irrational ways, but, and then they do have the power to enforce this upon humanity, or they think they do, that, that we should stop going along. Well, I heard you say something along the lines of, correct me if I'm wrong, that a, a lot of the things that we hear about today um, related to policing, whether it's defund the police or the idea of um, trying to not have as many people in prisons, that it's really all about the idea of a much bigger concept of controlling people, like making real life a prison. Um, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but but can you kind of fill in what I'm trying to say? Sure. Um, well, and just to be clear, like I I, I totally acknowledge the um, the issues of the prison industrial complex. Right. And so the prison industrial complex grew up out of the last phase of globalization. So when um, the labor force, it was a, it was a direct correlation to how do we manage excess workforce, right? And that in that way, if we can criminalize poverty, uh, pursue the drug war, if we can incarcerate black and brown people, then we can put them in prison and as a commodity in prison, we can then create new economies of and extract profit from individuals in prison through prison labor, through managing populations, through healthcare, through these other avenues. It was a, ma- a way of, it was a brutal way of managing excess labor. So what we're looking at with the fourth industrial revolution coming in automation and robotics and AI is the platforming of incredible huge amounts of other labor um, to the extent that they would never want, that those in power would never want to build as many prisons as it would take to hold all of the people who would be accessed by this next round. Okay, um, they simply would not. It's they would not see that as a useful investment. Instead, what's happening with all of the satellites that are going up right now, the private satellite systems, is that um, there's this idea of geofencing, which was initially used for um, marketing purposes, that you could use GPS coordinates and market to people with their devices. Um, It was used for marketing, but it was also used with satellite connections to manage um, free-range livestock. So you could sort of put, it's almost like putting up an electric fence um, for livestock with, with tags, right? So in the, they, they were advancing that, that isn't this a wonderful model to manage, like free range, you don't actually have to put up the fences, you can just reprogram the GPS coordinates for these herds, right, with these sensor networks. Mm. And so if you sort of combine these two things with the contact tracing, what I believe is coming is that the devices will be used to manage us remotely through the telecommunications networks, um, 5G and then 6G is coming. Um, 6G is robot-to-robot communication. And new shifts towards a, a, an automated police force through drones and also these crazy, you know, police dogs <laughs> that they've got, oh you God. know, out there that's been normalized now, the, the Boston Dynamics dogs. Um, and that you will contain the populace 
through their access to um, either their physical access, and this is what I've, I've talked about a little bit around immigration, like the nature of borders will change because they can throw up borders in real time, you know, <laughs> and we've seen that already. Like, why would they arbitrarily say people could only travel five miles from their house, you know, in other countries? Oh, you can only travel five miles from your house, mm-hmm. you know, at some point, oh, you, you're, we've said that you're infected, you can't leave your house. Right? They can put up arbitrary borders around you um, to contain populations. Um, but then also there's going to be a shift. All of the people who are pushed into being dependent on the government, those benefits will live on a device, um, you know, at least initially probably a phone, but possibly later as some sort of, you know, embedded chip that they can wipe that SIM card, you know, remotely if you don't obey all of the rules. Wow. And so, um, you know, we have to understand it's like a global open air prison run from space. <laughs> Sounds like a Philip Dick novel. <laughs> no, and, and, then, and then some people, if you feel like you're the person who's going to obey all of the rules, then maybe you think like there's not a problem, but you never know what the rules are going to be from day to day or if you're going to, you know, be caught against them. Right. Right. And, you know, what I said is if people look up Bluffdale, like there's the NSA built a giant data center in Utah to hold 100 years worth of Internet information on every living person. And they promise they won't look at it like what unless there's a FISA order on you or something. But like right. what happens <laughs> if you get profiled into doing something that was perfectly legal two years ago, like right. walking around without a mask or something and then, you know, or gathering in a group of people. And then all of a sudden you're like risk profiled as a threat to some you know recent change in the law. Because we're, we're seeing this crazy and somewhat, you know, you know, changes to laws and protocols that, that don't seem to make a lot of sense logically. Hmm. You know, it, it's funny. Um, in recent years, uh, people have been hearing little bits about uh, social credit scores coming out of China. And, and I think people here kind of laugh at it and think like, oh, it's not going to affect us or it's just like something from a Black Mirror episode. But... I think you've been talking about how like it is coming here. It's already started to some extent. And what role will, will social credit scores or something like social credit scores play in, in all of the things that you're referring to? Well, I, you know, I would just say, I think, I mean, there's a lot of fluidity between like Silicon Valley and Beijing and China. Um, so I think sometimes we think of it as like, oh, that's over there. But really, like, the credit scoring systems are very sophisticated here as well. Like, and, and, and so, you um, know, I, I think in many respects, some of this technocracy that we're talking about, like an industrial engineered society, was actually probably brought into China through um, U.S. interests, like when, you know, Nixon and Zbigniew Brzezinski. And so that's sort of been incubated there because it was culturally more acceptable and that we'll be bouncing back. Um, so, you know, if you understand that these new investment products are based on predictive analytics, like your social credit score would relate to, um, you know, your human cap, your value as human capital, right? Like your brand. And, you know, I, I mentioned it before, but like if you were, one of the rabbit holes that I went down and I encourage people if they want to actually look into it a little bit more, there's something called Global Education Futures Forum. Um, it's, it was set up by a man named Pavel Leksha, who's in, in Russia, but the U.S. contact is Tom Vander Ark, who is formerly of the Gates Foundation. And um, the Global Education Futures Forum has done a number of documents, of foresight documents, sort of anticipating what things will look like for education. And they have a big map, and it's quite fascinating to see how they've mapped things out. And one of the things, it talked about human capital futures specifically, and then it talked about people there, that you would be a billionaire investing in people. Okay, so that was very clear that they knew what this plan was. So if you imagine if you have a portfolio of people, you know, you would want to, you know, I guess look for the good value. I mean, I don't know if you're an investor, that's what you do. You look for value, right? And so you would want to find somebody who, you know, was improvable with a little limited intervention. <laughs> which mm-hmm. yes. um, so in the more that we think of as AI is guiding things and the Internet of Things is these real-time data analytics, you know, that maybe you're full, like, you know, they know when you wake up, they know when you go to bed, they know when, you know, they're talking smart toilets, you know, they're talking smart, all of these things. Um, that the AI could be guiding these investment pro- protocols or potentially even affecting these smart environments to make you a better or worse risk. And, and you had mentioned, too, about the, the big short. 
the thing that I forgot to mention was, you know, in that, that film, which was very good about talking about the housing crisis and how it unfolded, the people who were making the, the big money shorted, made um, shorts on this market. So they actually bet that the ho- against the housing market, which was unheard of at the time. No one had ever bet that the housing market would falter. But the people who, who saw the data, they were the ones who made that bet. And then they, they, they made, did very well for themselves. And so what I'm saying is with these portfolios of people, if you understand it as a giant game of gambling, there will be people who will actually short individuals, right? So there may be some people who are betting that you will achieve your pathway goal, you know, that you've been put on by the social worker. But there may also be people who, who believe that you won't. And, and what I'm trying to sort of get through to people is that if this is, if the Federal Reserve banking systems are setting up these human capital markets and they're tying them to smart city environments, um, it could very well be, and if we move towards some sort of generalized artificial intelligence singularity moment, that our worlds make us more or less likely to fail. <laughs> and then, what, one, we don't even have any autonomy, you know, in our choices, that our choices are taken out of our hands and put in the hands of healthcare providers or social workers or educators or whatever, however that manifests, that we don't actually have a choice. And increasingly, those entities aren't even people anymore, but they are avatars. They are algorithms. Oh, my goodness. I, I know we don't have too much more time, Allison. I, I, I have to have you on the program again. You're so interesting. Um, I, I know a lot of people are very concerned with how this pandemic has altered the lives of people all over the world in ways that we could never imagine. Uh, people are stuck at home. A lot of people can't work anymore. People can't enjoy art and films and going to concerts. People can't practice their religions. I mean, people's culture is being changed, like, very dramatically. Um, What are the things that are going on in in terms of the pandemic um, that really alarm you the most and and, and give you the sense that this is part of some of the things that you saw were coming anyhow, with the Great Reset? Well, I would encourage people to look at the Commons Project. And the Commons Project is actually, um, it's a collaboration of the Rockefeller Foundation and the World Economic Forum. And some of the, they have three products right now, but there will probably be more. They're all based on data analytics. And um, the, the one that people are hearing about is this airport travel pass, like a mobility pass, Yeah. Um, the Commons common pass. Um, but then the, also there are other two are, um, there's a pass for access to work and employment. And then there's one that's like sort of like real time biosensors, uh, real time medical updates. And, you know, early on in this pandemic, there was, I think the head of the St. Louis federal reserve sort of advanced this idea that every person should be tested every day, which seemed crazy because at the time, like nobody could even get tests and, and it just was really odd. But it's very clear to me that there is a push towards um, uh, biosensors and um, towards, if you look up DARPA and Profusa, um, but, but it's very clear that, that these injections that they're advancing are towards um, sort of putting a frame of reference of that we are going to have a global biosecurity state and that we will be managed through injection of these biosensors. And to me, I think that there are huge um, questions about um, population level bioengineering <laughs> and what that means, especially when that's coming out of largely military spaces and, and, and the interests who are looking at confining us and containing us are these larger finance and technology companies. Um, two of the individuals, one of the architects of the Common Pass Project, his name is J.P. Pollock, and he's based out of the Cornell Technion uh, Lab on uh, Roosevelt Island in, in the East River, and he and Deborah Estrin are part of this Internet of Things biosensors tracking behavior analytics, um, the small data lab there. So I, I really do feel like in many respects we are be, being treated as livestock, and we are being our agency is being taken from us, and that we are being – it is being framed that now our our bodies are, unless we can prove otherwise, are national security threats, and that, that we must um, be engineered for a new environment that maybe is going to largely be determined by nanotechnology, which is something I think very few people are familiar with. And um, it's, it's, 
concerning. I mean, I, I think that there are many, many aspects of this fourth industrial revolution that need further interrogation as to whether they are in the best interests of humanity and the rest of the living things on the planet, and that, that these decisions are being made by powerful interests without informed consent by the public. Are you concerned um, that, um, I mean, it seems like every time I find out about something interesting like this, the next time I go to look it up, uh, Google, the first story that will come up is that it, it either doesn't exist anymore or that it's been debunked, um, that, that there's going to be censorship uh, of, of people <laughs> who are going to be, you know, unable to explain these things to us anymore. What's well, interesting that you say that. Yeah. <laughs> Because I just, one of the resources that I've used for three years to um, develop, I, I do very extensive mapping, which helps people see the connections. And I always say, I like to be proven wrong. I don't want to be right about this, but look at the information that I've put together and tell me, like, if you have a different analysis. And this, this platform that I've used for three years, and I've put an incredible amount of effort into entering data because it's all crowdsourced. It's all you enter the data yourself and provide the documentation. It's called LittleSys, littlesys.org. And it's actually, it's funded by Open Society. And I knew that going in, but I, I didn't quite think that they would, like, crash it. Um, but essentially today I was taken offline because I was told that I was not allowed to put in things like artificial intelligence or um, the prison industrial complex. Um, and then after I was shut out of my platform and then after they banned my IP address in my home, um, a friend of mine could see the edits that were being taken out and they were um, back in California, um, Tony Blair, like Tony Blair was taken off. And these are power, like you're we're map, we're supposedly mapping the power, right? Like you would take off someone who was, you know, the, the former prime minister of the UK as being an illegitimate entry. So they were just throwing things in the memory hole at that point, um, including Adrian Hill, who was working on, um, you know, one of the vaccine programs in the UK. They were just deleting it all after they kicked me out. And so it is very true that the, this the truth doesn't want to be seen. I mean, these individuals do not want the truth out, um, which to me indicates all the more reason that we have to find other ways to get it out. I guess master's tools, you know, full disclosure, they're, they're not going to let us get it out. So, um, but I do believe that, you know, in my broader scheme that the world was not meant to come to this and that, and I've been very touched by how many people from all around the world that I've connected with over this because it is affecting everyone around the globe and parents and grandparents and, you know, just artists and musicians and people, they don't understand why. That's the thing. They don't understand the why. And the why that I'm giving them is to say the fourth industrial revolution is coming. The plan is to build a global prison planet and to use us as livestock, as data livestock, both to build it and then to manage us on the farm that is the earth under their biosecurity state and and we need to like claim our autonomy and and this this and i i'm always very clear about framing this is racialized and it's very hard to me for me because many of the people who are resisting are framing it as as a patriotism but i think in many respects this is a, a reckoning of our country around the history of enslavement and the history of indigenous genocide so we need to be clear about understanding that, that what is happening is this sort of larger arc of dispossession of people, that, that we have to kind of know that, right? And that, that in my feeling that the patriot framing, the constitutional framing is not the correct framing, that the framing is to actually reconcile with the true origins of the country and then understand with that knowledge that we should work collaboratively, especially to protect the most vulnerable. Well, we've been speaking with Allison McDowell. She's a mom. She's an independent researcher, and um, she's very smart. And if you're just learning about some of the things that Allison is talking about and um, you, you're not sure what to make of all this, I, I invite you to take a look at her website, wrenchinthegears.com, and, you know, just spend some time reading it. You know, like she said herself, you know, she invites you to take a look and, you know, to challenge her. Um, I, I think she's genuinely, you know, um, looking into this stuff with, with the best of intentions. And Allison, I want to thank you for the research that you're doing. And um, I, I wish you the best of luck with, with all your, your work. And I hope that we can talk again in the future. Yeah, it would be great. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks again so much for joining us on The Sounds of Film. Um, is there is there any place else besides your website that you'd like to direct people to? Um, I mean, I, I, 
I have a, a YouTube channel for now. It's if you just look up Allison McDowell YouTube, it's kind of it's you know it's just a basic YouTube channel. Also, my my friend um, Jason Bosch, he he actually came out from Denver in May to film me talking about this, which seemed crazy because I was like, really? But he's an independent amateur film, you know, independent filmmaker and documentary guy, and his website is Argus Fest um, is his YouTube channel, and he has a lot of really good interviews there with some uh, quite a bit of with me, and then also with some other really good thinkers on this topic. So I would recommend that as well. Yeah, Ar- saw, Argus Fest on YouTube. Yeah, I saw some awesome. of those videos that he 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 you know he took of you um, you know talking about some of this stuff, and is is that going to be turned into a film? We really don't know what's going. On. <laughs> it's a journey, right? Yeah. Well, I think it <laughs> you know, should be. It's, it's it's a journey. You know, he's doing that on a shoestring, and me, and we're all just trying our best to get tell the tell this bigger story because it's the finance part, it's the hedge fund part that isn't that is the missing piece. So people need to really pay attention to that. Okay. Well, thank you again, Allison, and I wish you the best of luck with everything. All right. Thank, all thank right. you. All right. Good night. Bye bye.